Um, so, methods in ecology and evolution symposium, and methods in ecology and evolution has published an awful lot of methods, which is a really good thing. Um, and when um, I was invited to give a talk, um, it got me to wondering, well, what happens after the fact, you know? Um, someone at this symposium had to be a little bit different, and uh, I decided to take a slightly different view um, and talk about my experience about publishing a method um, and how it's actually been used. So um, in this edition of Methods in Ecology and Evolution, um, I published a little paper, you can see it there, it's a very little paper, called uh, Pop Demo, an R package for population demography using projection matrix analysis. It pretty much does what it says um, on the tin. Um, and really, it was just a collection of things that I found really useful during my PhD. Um, I was studying demography, um, I was using R, I was coding things up because um, they didn't exist um, for me to use already. Um, and then eventually I decided that maybe these things would be more useful to me if I put them in an R package. And then I decided um, that maybe that R package could be useful to other people. And then I decided maybe I'd try and publish a paper with it. And then something unprecedented happened. Some people actually read the paper. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I, started getting, um, I started getting papers to review which had, had used these things. Um, so I'm kind of you know, sort of looking forward to the next five years. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to... Um, some of the methods that have been published at the moment um, being used for really cool stuff. Um, so most of this package um, focused on something um, relatively new in population ecology, or at least relatively newly used, uh, called transient dynamics. So I'm going to spend a little while explaining what transient dynamics are. So imagine that you have a stage-structured life cycle. Here's a very simple example of a stage-structured life cycle. Um, stage structured life cycles can exhibit transient dynamics. Um, so in this case, we have arrows that represent movement um, within or between stages, and each arrow represents what might happen in any given time frame. For example, say one month. So in one month, um, a caterpillar can remain being a caterpillar, um, or it can become a chrysalis, a chrysalis can become a but butterfly, and et cetera, et cetera. And in ecology, what we do is we attach probabilities to these things. So apologies if there are any entomologists in the audience. I completely made these numbers up, but it's just an example. Um, so I say, well, maybe 5% of the caterpillars survive each month. 5% become a chrysalis, so 90% of them die. Um, every butterfly each month has, on average, 200 offspring or something like that. Um, and we can put these into a matrix model, and that's what um, my uh, R package focused on. Um, and people have historically done um, a few things with these matrix models. Um, first thing they do is they work out lambda, the long-term population growth rate. And in this case, it's roughly equal to 1. And lambda roughly equal to 1 means that your population does not really grow and it does not really decline. It's quite stable. Um, and they also do sensitivity and elasticity analyses. Um, and what that means is they try to understand how changing any one of these vital rates can change the population growth rate. Um, so if we had a population of conservation concern, we do a sensitivity or elasticity analysis to find out which of these um, life cycle transitions we need to target to increase population growth rate. Conversely, if we have um, a pest that we want to control, we look at which one is best to decrease population growth rate. Um, and at the moment, and today, I'm talking about um, density independent and time invariant models. but um, some analogies um, of these things exist for stochastic models and density-dependent models as well. Um, but they always focus on, uh, historically, on you know, average long-term growth rates, equilibria, things like that. But there are these things called uh, transient dynamics, which um, screw with all of this. And um, transient dynamics happen when the population is not at its stable stage structure. Um, so here we have a triangle, um, and it, if the closer you are to a corner of the triangle, the more um, of each stage you have um, in the population. Um, and the ratio has always got to add up to one, that's why it's a triangle. Um, and in this case, the stable stage structure is somewhere down here. Lots and lots of caterpillars, not very much of anything else, and that's probably because in my toy example, um, there's very low survival and very high fecundity. But what happens if you have a population which starts in a completely different place to this? What happens if you have a population that starts up here? 
So say this could be a dispersal event, for example. Um, you have only adult butterflies in the population. So I'm going to run through a quick time series of, in this toy example, the first, if the time step is a month, the first year, and just watch up for where the numbers flash up on the screen. So we start off with all adults, and then we have lots of caterpillars, and it moves towards chrysalises, you'd probably expect that because they're moving through the life cycle in one month, and they're kind of cycling around here, and they're moving towards stable stage structure, which is what we would expect, but most of the time they're not actually at stable stage structure um, and carry on cycling around and you get to the end of the first year and you're somewhere there near a stable stage structure but not actually at it. Um, so these things, lambda and sensitivity and elasticity analysis, it's not necessarily very good for actually understanding the population structure because it's changing, it's fluctuate, fluctuating all the time. What does that mean for the population size? Well, um, <coughs> The population size, oh, sorry, I've just put the plots on there so you can see all of them. Um, the population size does something like this, it's cycling. Um, and so you can see that it's cycling around stability, but it's not stable. <laughs> um, you know, it, lambda equals one is not describing the dynamics of this population at all. Now, this is quite an extreme example, but we do see this all the time. Um, and so there's been some interest recently in trying to quantify these effects. Um, but the problem is that transient dynamics are not particularly easy to measure. They can do all sorts of things. Um, so again, we're still just with density independent and time invariant models. But here's four different plants. Um, they're cycling. They're getting bigger than they would be if they were at stable structure. They get bigger and then they get smaller or they just get smaller. You can measure transient dynamics really at any time point in the projection. There's just a couple marked here which have sort of turned out to be quite useful um, and important. The, what, you d what happens in the very, very first time step, so your immediate response to um, some kind of disturbance that changes your population structure, and the kind of infinitesimal um, consequences of transient dynamics as well. You know, how much bigger or smaller does your population end up uh, in the long term as a result of transient dynamics? Um, so they're quite hard to measure. Um, and part of Pop Demo and some stuff that I've published in uh, Methods and Ecology and Evolution was doing this. You throw some complicated maths at it, and you can measure transient growth or density and some kind of thing that's um, similar to, to sensitivity. Um, so I don't want you to worry about the maths because um, it's a little bit confusing. Um, but what I do want you to know is that really, transiently, you can do two things. You can either amplify, which means that you get larger than you would have been if you're at stable stage structure or you can attenuate which means you get smaller than you would have been at stable stage structure and most of the time this is going to be in response to some kind of disturbance some kind of change to population structure an example could be perhaps there's a hurricane that comes along and wipes out all of the big trees in your population uh, or perhaps there's a disease that comes out and wipes out all of the youngsters in your population um, or perhaps there's a dis dispersal event like we had earlier. Um, so the population structure is somehow changed and you can respond if you're a stage structured organism as most organisms are um, or structured in a life cycle structured in some way by either amplifying or attenuating. So now that we've got that sort of basic, um, those basic facts down, um, I'm going to give you some examples of some cool things that people have done with this. Um, so uh, there are lots and lots of examples of cool transit dynamics studies out there. I've just picked a few, um, and particularly a few that have um, used some of the methods that I published, which was very kind of them. So first thing I'm going to talk about um, an example in conservation. Um, this is a tiny little orchid that's endemic to uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, the authors here wanted to understand how looking at the transit dynamics might change um, the priorities for conservation in the species. It has a relatively simple um, life cycle here. And the authors did um, some sensitivity analysis of lambda. So here we can see the structure of uh, the matrix that you set up. Um, and basically you're looking at um, individuals moving from one stage class into another. So if you're moving into stage class two from stage class one, then that transition is represented in the two one spot. Um, and there's something that you can see here that we find an awful lot of the time is that sensitivity of lambda is highest um, to the larger or the older individuals, um, and also it's much, lambda is much more sensitive to um, survival or growth than it is to fecundity. Um, and you can see that because in these six populations of this orchid, 
um, on the right hand side those red bars are much much larger um, than all of the other bars in the plot and so the authors um, used uh, the PopDemo software to look at the transient dynamics of this orchid um, and here's one example um, from one of the populations but the others look similar and so on the x-axis you have um, the amount that you perturb the vital rate by um, and on the y-axis you have the um, response of uh, population inertia and that's what I was talking about earlier about the long-term consequences of, of transient dynamics and these actually also include the non-linearity in the transients as well and so what we really want to focus on here is what you would do if you were um, managing according to your results from lambda and what you would do is you would increase the survival and the growth of um, of these larger older individuals and what you can see is that if you go if you increase the survival so if there's no perturbation at zero here or zero here um, if you increase the survival you actually damage the transient dynamics um, and what that means is although you might get better long-term increases um, long-term growth in your population you can actually be really damaging it in the short term um, by basing your population management just on uh, on lambda and I've got another conservation example here um, of a, a Hawaiian vine um, and these are really cool because um, they're harvested to um, make the Hawaiian garlands um, but harvesting of them has um, led to population decline and so these authors wanted to understand um, what's the, the best way for reintroduced populations, what's the base, best way to manage them. And so again, they did sensitivity, or in this case, elasticity, which is a um, modified form of sensitivity analysis of um, the vital rates. And we've got the same result again. Um, on the left-hand side here for these two populations, you can see that the um, long-term growth rate is much more sensitive to changing the adult parameters than the juvenile parameters. And on the right-hand side, it's much more sensitive to stasis, most of which is formed um, of survival, than it is to fecundity. But then if you actually look at what happens when you do these things, you get very different results. So um, increasing adult survival, which is what your lambda um, analysis told you to do, um, actually results in quite a large population decline immediately before the population reaches a stable state and starts increasing. And you have fewer individuals that you can harvest for your garlands. Whereas if you increase juvenile survival rather than adult survival, you get a much, much less pronounced decline before you um, reach your stable structure. And so you end up with a larger population and more individuals in the long term that can be harvested. So again, in this case, if you base your um, population management just on lambda, which is what people have been doing for decades, you can actually really do bad things to the population. So the next example I'm going to talk about is disease. Um, and this is the American chestnut. And um, about half a century ago, I think it was, um, or maybe longer actually, um, chestnut blight fungus was introduced to America. And um, the American chestnut population was devastated. Um, but then, after that, a hypovirus, which infects the fungus, found its way to America. And the trees started being um, less infected. Um, or fewer of them were infected, and the population started recovering. So you have this thing where it starts being healthy, becomes infected with a fungus, and then becomes infected with a hypovirus. And so the authors of this paper wanted to understand, you know, what um, are the potential transient consequences um, of these changes in states um, for, for this population. And so if we first focus on tra transitioning from a healthy to a fungus-infected population, um, they don't actually know the population structure of these trees, right? So we're talking very, very large population across North America. But what they said is, well, we take a conservative uh, approach and we'll say, well, assume the population is a stable structure. What happens if we move from being a stable structure of a healthy population to a stable structure of a fungus-infected population? Because if you are at stable structure of a healthy population and then you switch to being fungus-infected, suddenly you're not at stable structure because the, the, um, the goalposts have been changed. And this is what happens. So on the left-hand side, you can see the stage-specific um, increases or declines. But the important thing here is on the right-hand side, once you transition from being healthy to fungus-infected, you get these transient dynamics which cause you to attenuate. They cause you to decrease faster than you would be de decreasing if you were um, at stable structure. 
And then if we look um, at the transition from fungus-infected to hypovirus-infected populations, we see the exact opposite. Um, so again, we've got the stage-specific um, things here. And then the population size over time, when you transition from fungus-infected to hypovirus-infected, causes you to amplify in the short term before you reach a declining period. So in this case, what the authors argue is that um, the su supposed recovery of these chestnut populations might just be a very transient thing. It might be a transient response to um, a change in the stable population structure. Uh, and that actually we should be keeping an eye on them because after about uh, 20 years it could start declining again because um, the population still isn't healthy enough to maintain long-term population growth rate. Okay, the next uh, example I'm going to talk about is invasion. And I have to give special thanks to um, these guys, and I hope I pronounced their names right, David Ellers, um, Rob Sargera Gomez, Peter Adler, and Dave Coons, um, because I actually reviewed this manuscript for them for Journal of Ecology, and I really liked it, and I wanted to include it in the talk. So I cheekily emailed them, and I said, can I include it in the talk? And they said yes. Um, so this is brand new stuff, um, which is currently in review, and I hope soon to be accepted. Um, and they, <laughs> they, um, I gave them a very nice review. Um, <laughs> they they uh, have studied matrices in the Compadre uh, plant matrix database, which is held um, at the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research, is where I'm from, and I'm also working on this. Um, and most plants um, have a, a, life a life cycle which uh, might look something like this. Um, as in, they start off as being seed and then, and then they grow bigger. And when they invade a new place, the unit of dispersal is the seed, okay? So um, what these guys do is they said, well, well, let's take all the known population models of plants um, and let's see what happens if we um, set up fake populations of seeds and we'll subject them to demographic stochasticity and we'll subject them to different um, initial population sizes and just see what happens. And we'll look at the long-term and the transients. The first thing you need to know is if you're going to have a viable population, you have to have a long-term growth rate that is just larger than one. Okay? So they looked at all of those individuals that had long-term growth rates that are larger than one. Um, and this is what happened. So you can see that nearly all the populations attenuate um, and remain smaller than they would have been if they were at stable straight stage structure. That's not surprising because seeds um, will die and they'll fail to germinate um, and it takes a little time before um, the plants grow big enough to then reproduce and start. So this attenuation is um, something that you might expect. Um, but they were looking at, at not just viability according to your long-term growth rate but to your short-term growth rate as well. Uh, sorry, your sort of short-term transient <coughs> dynamics. Um, and what they found was actually these points, so the absolute smallest that your population gets um, over the course of its um, projection, they're really, really important for population viability. Um, and you can see that in this graph. So on the uh, x-axis for these, uh, this left-hand column, um, we have the, uh, the, the attenuation that your population, or the maximum attenuation that your population endures when it's um, when it's dispersed. Um, and here we have population viability. So you can see a um, very, very clear result here that the um, sort of the better for you that your transit dynamics following um, invasion are, um, the more likely your population is to be viable. It's also sensitive to the number of individuals um, in the initial population. And it's also sensitive to lambda, um, as in the long-term growth rate. But your transient dynamics, it turns out, are equally as important as your long-term growth rate or your um, initial stage structure in these simulations. And that's quite a big thing because people have been looking um, at, you know, how uh, do the number of inv individuals in an invasion affect the invasion success? How does the long-term growth rate affect it? But this is the first thing that I've seen that said, well, your transient dynamics are really, really important too. Lastly, I'm going to finish off with a little bit of my own work. So thanks to my co-authors, um, my PhD supervisors, Dave Hodgson and Stuart Townley, um, and Miguel Franco as well. Um, we've talked, um, I've talked a lot about how your transient dynamics can affect your, uh, your demography and sort of what's happening in the near term. But now we're starting to think about how your transient dynamics might also affect your life history evolution. Uh, and the reason we do this is 
um, the reason we're thinking about this is because um, over the years, lots of people um, have used population growth rate as a measure of fitness. Um, and they're trying to understand how um, life histories can evolve um, using that as um, one of the surrogacies for fitness. Um, and so we want to understand what transit dynamics might do. And so the first thing that we thought is, well, if you're being subjected to disturbances um, that reduce your population density and change your population structure, you really should have evolved to be resilient to those disturbances. So if you are a coral and you live in um, some wonderful Caribbean sea somewhere and every 10 years you're hit by a hurricane, you really should have evolved a life history that allows you to bounce back from that. And so we, again, we use Compadre to look at this. Um, and we took um, models which had a known current stage structure and a known population matrix. And we just projected them to see what they did. Um, and so this is um, in the very first time step again. And this is the long-term consequences of transient dynamics. And here's the relative density. And you can see that across all these different life histories, although it's different um, according to the sort of life history that you have, Across all of them, we control for phylogeny here. You are very, very, very likely um, to bounce back from disturbance. Um, and so, you know, we're looking into the idea that this might be kind of an evolved thing. Um, and perhaps you wouldn't just evolve to have um, a good long-term growth rate. You would also evolve to have good transient dynamics. And that would depend on how often and how severely um, and how exactly you are um, disturbed. And then we took this one step further and we said, well, okay, that's, those are the disturbances that things are actually experiencing. What about all disturbances, like any possible population structure that you could have? And so we simulated um, all of the possible population structures that all of these models could have, and we did the same phylogenetic analysis um, again. And you can see here, although it's on a logic scale, so it's um, a little bit weird, but you can see if you look at the right-hand column that your probability here of amplifying in response to a disturbance rather than attenuating is really high. Like, we're talking average probabilities of 0.99 um, or higher, and none of the confidence intervals um, cross um, 0.5. So you have, you're very, very, very likely to amplify in response to any given um, disturbance um, rather than attenuate. And so I think it's really interesting. We're looking into um, the possibilities that um, life histories might have evolved to have this um, as an adaptive thing to deal with um, environmental disturbance. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Happy fifth birthday to Methods in Ecology and Evolution. I'm very glad you're here. You published half of my PhD thesis. Um, <laughs> thanks to all my collaborators, um, and thank to all of you for listening. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's nice to hear that we actually publish stuff that's useful. <laughs> <laughs> so, are there any questions? Okay, well, whilst you think about that, we do actually have a question from Twitter. Oh, cool. <laughs> from Edgar Gonzalez. Um, like, how's your package different from our packages, Pop Bio and IB IPM Pack? Now, that's more, in more interesting. Are you considering joining forces to make a general package? <laughs> so, um, we're different from PopBio in that uh, PopBio published a lot of the very traditional analyses. Um, and this focuses on, so I w in my PhD, one of my supervisors was a, ma was a mathematician, and he specializes in control theory. Um, and so we actually borrowed a whole lot of things which are very old in, in engineering, but very new in ecology, um, to understand how, um, and we, they're called transfer functions if anyone's interested, um, to understand how you can take just one simple matrix, um, because previously this, you could only do a certain number of things. Can you take one matrix, um, because a lot of people only have one matrix, it requires a lot of data, and can you do more useful things with that? Um, so there are a there's a bunch of stuff that's included in, in uh, Pop Demo that is not included in Pop Bio. Um, IPM Pack, um, also an excellent package, which is new. Um, they uh, focus on integral projection models, so it's a slightly different model set to what we have here. Um, the matrix models and integral projection models are, are certainly related um, and hopefully we will, I would like to join forces a little bit and migrate some of the um, methods that we've produced here for uh, matrix models and reproduce them in integral projection models, yes. Okay, great, because mathematically 
you can go the other way because IPMs, I mean, you can start using measure theory. Yeah. But I don't know whether it's whether are your methods uh, applicable when you've got a continuous uh, function, got continuous. They should states, be, yeah. yeah. Um, there are s some of them certainly will be, and then some of them there'll be some kinks to iron out, but I think that they should be. Okay. But,